What do you think drives him? Yeah, you, know, you see what you learn and uh, or you try to learn, quite frankly, is you never get to the bottom of somebody's motivation. And if you examine it, generally there are several motivators. And clearly one of Trump's motivators is his ego, his self-confidence. Uh, I'm going to do it my way. So, you know, he's a remarkable figure. But uh, he, you know, they, t they talk about people uh, in poverty in this country, people who are struggling and so forth. And they, they talk about this, the millions of people in the United States who are at risk. Uh, Donald Trump is at risk, not for those reasons, but because the connective tissue to meeting the needs of real people is what the presidency is about. And we know that presidents of the United States, leaders of, of countries, uh, Australia, you name it, can do great things for people, but they've got to have that sense of what their obligation is that goes beyond their political aspirations or their ego. We can describe these scenes and these moments and this history, but uh, I don't think, at least for me personally, the picture is complete. He's so diplomatic. <laughs> Robert, how would you describe that? When Bob Woodward and I sat down with Trump five years ago, March 2016, Trump looked at us and said, real power is, I don't even want to say the word, real power is fear. He also said, rage, I always bring it out, I always have. Fear and rage, two titles for Bob's previous books on Trump. And now we're in this, as Biden said at his inauguration, a quote, winter of peril. But I always think back to that, those quotes from those, that Trump interview. When you say what drives him, what motivates him, he brought up fear, he brought up rage. What would be the question you asked him today? I think it's the question uh, I always thought about asking Nixon, who was not uh, willing to be interviewed for our Watergate coverage. But I would ask Trump, why? Why are you doing this? What's driving you? What do you care about? What do you feel your real responsibility is? What are the, if, if you can use this word with him, what are your moral and human obligations to others if you are president of the United States or seek that office? And there ought to be discussions about that because there is a moral dimension to leading a country. I think there's really a double, triple moral obligation for the United States because of that expectation of stability and good sense and morality that other countries have about us and what uh, it is the, the experience is that confidence has been put in doubt. It has been shaken. What do you think the answers to those questions are? Don't know. That's why we get to do fresh reporting every day. A few people who have read the book have emailed me and told me that reading Peril is like having a nightmare. But they said they forced themselves to finish it because they do not want to look away. That this is their country, their democracy, and that the details matter. That January 6th and the transition period went by quickly, in a sense, like a firestorm, and now Biden's in his presidency. But Woodward and I had the opportunity to go back in granular detail, mm. paint a portrait of what really happened. And it was a darker time, a more complicated time than we knew when we began this book. And, that, and that's why so many people are responding to it uh, in the United States and elsewhere, 
because they really want to know what actually happened, what is happening in this country. They can sense the peril, uh, but when they read it in detail inside the room, they understand that everything in terms of American power and American democracy might be, if this reporting is read, it shows it might be much more fragile than people imagine, that people are in these positions of power, especially the presidency, and have immense power, and how they used it and use it to this day must be tracked. And that's why we, we end the book with the phrase, peril remains. Donald Trump is not some forgotten shadow on the American political scene. He's on the campaign trail, giving speeches with warlike cadences, stealing at times the rhetoric of Winston Churchill. We will never surrender. We will never give in. The election was stolen. Why isn't someone from the Republican Party standing up? What's happened to that great party? And what happened since um, he was voted out? What's he learned from it? What's he doing right now to plot and to plan and to execute those who stood in his way before? In our book, we show President Trump returning to his estate in Florida, Mar-a-Lago, after the election. Uh, but he's not in political exile. In fact, the head of the House Republicans, Kevin McCarthy, comes down to Florida to have a cheeseburger with Trump. And they talk amiably about Trump's role in the party and his uh, return to the campaign trail ahead of the 2022 elections. Leader McConnell in the Senate is far more hostile, at least politically, to Trump. Uh, but he knows, as well as McCarthy, that polling bears out that Trump has political capital immense political capital in the GOP. Scene after scene in the book shows Trump being briefed by his pollsters in the summer of 2021. And they're telling him, no one's more popular. The nomination is yours for the taking if you want it in 2024. The voters are still with you. And Brad Parscale, his former campaign manager, says privately in the summer of this year that Trump had an army an army for Trump. He wants it back. He wants that political army back. And Parscale added, if he runs again, it will be for vengeance. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.